Hello, my name is Raymond. My DJ name is the Grand Slam DJ Jam from the Super Bad Disco. Seventy, seventy-one. When I, I was a child growing up in here, the same house. My father had the, my father had music, and a lot of his music was soul music, and it had like it drum breaks and stuff in it. So I was brought up on that already. So he, the music was here. He had two turntables and he had a mixer, but he wasn't, it wasn't mixing. He had the two turntables and the mixer so he can go from side to side. He would play the music and then the break would come in the music and he was always into it. Like, like the breaks and stuff like that. Like James Brown and Ike Turner. Uh, it was a whole lot of different stuff. And I came up on that. I came up in that. And it stuck with me. So I say about 74, I got a little older. I bought my first record, my first record from a record store, and it was Graham Scherzer Station, The Jam. And you see where I got my name from, right? That's where I got my name from, the DJ Jam. But that, it, that record has certain sections where everybody break down, and a lot of songs back in those days break down for the, the one particular artist to do their solos. And every, the, the drummer always had the last solo. I don't know why, but they did. So the drum breaks were in my mind, like I said, they were in my mind again. I don't want to skip off the subject, but me and Graham was a Rasheen. We used to be up in the garage up the street, and we used to like play, like we knew songs, and we'd be up there on pots and pans and cans playing drums and stuff, like like the Mandrill records, like Mandrill, come on everybody, and we'd be up in the garage like playing like the Cosby Kids did. And when the Cosby Kids, the cartoon came on, we were up there like playing the drums and the stuff. Like this is me and Graham, but this we were kids, but that's how far we go back. I'm talking seventy. 71 and we were like playing the drums playing like playing acting like we were mandrill so that's I'm, I'm giving you the history of me and him even before everybody even know what about dj and anything we were kids we were friends never had an argument we were always one always he's right he lived 55 42 i live 55 41 that's how close we are anyway so my father used to go to work i would come down here and play the records and put the records on that I heard him play such such the night before and put this record on and try to find that certain part of the record that he played. All right, I stumbled on to something. I tried to pull it back to bring the, 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 get, the get the record to that break in the record and I pulled it back and then I let it go. But I, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not saying that I invented anything, but I didn't know what I was doing, but I would do that just to get it and just let that part go. Then I did it on the other side and let, with another record and let that part go. But I never used the mixer. I just put the mixer just to bring it or fade it, however you want to say. But that's where I got it from. I never seen nothing like that in the street. We listened to certain records while we danced. My dad had those records that we used to dance to in the streets. So when we go parties or something like that, if they didn't have the records, I used to sneak the, my father's records out of here so we could have that same sound to dance to in the streets at the block parties. So. I would tell them to play this record, and then play this record, then play this record. That sounds like I'm getting into DJing. That's an introduction to DJing. So, went on and went on. Then the DJs used to come out there, and then disco came in, and a lot of DJs started DJing with the disco set. Everybody was playing their little music, like I said before. Philadelphia's known for the best disc jockeys, DJ personalities in the, in the country. So, I was already in tune with the music set, with the radio stations and everything. So, I stopped dancing a little bit and started, like, actually I went to uh, the Mayfair Ballroom and the Disco Doc and Papa used to DJ there. And they would play these certain songs, but they wasn't, there was no scratching, they just played back to back to back records. And I started bringing my records there and then they would play my records. The records were too long, you know, the records were like 10 minutes, 15 minutes long. So I'm trying to break it down to just a break so we can just break it down to the break. So I came out here one time and I played the records. I said, I'm gonna play, play this and then I tried to go real fast and catch it before at the end of that break to catch that break. So I caught this break and caught that break, but I would pull it back. And it's like, I didn't move the fader. You know, when you move the fader, you would take the sound out, the backward sound out. And I didn't pull, I didn't move the fader and pull it back and toot, and the sound came in, toot. So I started like toot, toot, jazzing up the, like jazzing up. That's what we call it, jazzing the beat up. That that was like that was preliminary, like when we first started, like when I first started, it was, I jazzed the beat up, like bring it. I'll bring the snare in, or I'll bring the bass drum in, so I can go or let let it coincide with that other record. 
So I didn't know what I was doing, but it sounded good. And then it would come in. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I stumbled onto something. I sat down here. The, the tables used to be right there. I stumbled onto it. And I did it every now and then, did it every now and then. And it then it caught on. So a friend of mine, who used to live across the street, named Steve. That's my, that was my partner. It was three of us. It was me, Master Groove, which is Steve, and Grand Wizard Rasheen. Grand Wizard Rasheen wasn't even a DJ at the time. He was our MC. He wasn't ever a DJ. He, he called, he's good. He, I'm, I'm not taking anything from him. He's spectacular. But he was not the DJ at the time. He was our MC. Fresh Prince's rapping style comes from Grand Wizard Rasheen. Yeah, that was that style. Nobody liked it. Nobody adapted to it. But he, he, that was that style. That's where it came from. That's where the Fresh Prince rap style came from. And nobody picked up on it. Steve, the guy, Master Groove, my, my partner, he had got some case money and bought some turntables and a mixer. Because we, all right, we knew about DJing, but we, it wasn't hip hop. But we, people started asking us to do parties because, like, like my father had the records and then we would sneak the records around. And everybody was like, y'all, no, y'all, DJ, you want to do a party? And my first party we did was after hours. We used to do after hour parties, me and Steve, and we used to do like, from like two in the morning to five in the morning. We were like 16, 17 years old. And my father would ask me where I was at. I was like, I was out DJing a party. He was like, DJing a party. We were like, what's DJing a party? <laughs> At two o'clock in the morning, was DJ in the party, so he never got on. He never got on me for it, but somebody else said, "Hey, they was DJ in the party. Let them do a block party." So we did a block party. We played all the songs that we 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 used to hear at the Mayfair Ballroom, and a couple of and the records that we used to dance to too in the street. Because back then, it was two maybe three rap records out then. It wasn't no so you had to play something else. You you couldn't did excuse me you couldn't do a party. And then think you was like a DJ and play three rap records for four hours. It wasn't going to last. So you had to play something else. So, so it was disco out, the, the, the new funk, the cameo and all that. Those songs were out. So we mixed all those in. And I took that scratch and brought it outside to the, the block parties. At, with, with the breaks, though. The records with the breaks. And it caught on. They were like, man, you was you was jamming, you was kicking it. What was that? I didn't, still didn't know, so we left it alone. Do another party next week. People heard it. They were saying, uh, okay, I'll get him to do my party since they that block party was like jamming and like the block party started getting more popular. We start we we would actually have hundred something people at a in the block party outside. Like block parties back then, when every when the neighborhood heard about it, everybody came. This is why we even while we were dancing, like we would come, we were dancing at the block party. We come, we would dress up and dance at the block parties, and people would come to watch us dance. Rasheen was one of the best dancers ever. Actually, me and Master Gru we used to dance. We was our own. We was called Funk Attack, and Grand was Rasheen was with us in a way. He, like we all danced together. Like, we were all friends. Franchise was a good was the like the top line group. They came and seen him dance with us. And dancing, you know, he was dancing and doing this little thing. They stole him. They took him right away. Man, they incorporated him in their group, and that was history. And we were like, oh, we can't, we're not going to beat them at the block party. They were sensational. <laughs> like we were good, we were good, but they were tap taps on their shoes. This is a block party. We teenagers taps on their shoes, pleated pants, shirts with their names on them, canes like twirling the canes and stuff, top hats. These are real kids. We had block party. This is how we dressed. But we did the best we could do. But they, that's what they did. And they were good. They were before their time. Like, if you look it up, stepping on the internet and look at, look at what they were doing, it hasn't been done since. Nobody's done it. It's not, it's not break dancing. It's stepping. It's completely different. If you see it, the Fred Astaire type of dance, the ballroom dance, but they added the little hip, the little jazz to it and the soul to it. It's incredible. You have to see it to believe it. That's what we were doing. That's what got me into DJing. Because I didn't like the music they were playing at the block parties. So I brought my own music to the block parties. And they said, you might as well just DJ since you're going to bring your music. And we do basement parties. And at the basement parties, people used to get dressed up, you know, go to basement parties. So, and it's certain people basements, you couldn't see the people in the basement. Because we'd say we'd be in the washroom or in the back room or in the front room. So we would never know how they were jamming. Or we would know that we were playing these records and it sounded good and it sounded good. And halfway through the party... There was a little, sex, a little segment that I used to do called the jam session. About 11, 11.30, 12 o'clock, 
I would just play breaks, beats, you know, stuff that I would find, like that I found, you know, throughout my travels. And it was all breaks, all beats. And it caught on. It caught on tremendously to the point where they was like, don't do the jam sets until we get there. That people would say this, like, all right, we gonna, they made sure, everybody made sure they were at that party at that particular time. So when I come on with the jam session, that they were there because this was like, this was, it was, it was never heard of nowhere. Nobody did it. I know nobody did it because I was, I was the only one that was doing it. We were to the point where you can't make a mistake when you're, when you're doing a jam session, we're doing any, anywhere. And when you're doing anything anywhere, you don't make no mistake because you, you people going to stop jamming. And that was our, that was, that was our motto. That was our forte. Like we were the best. If you make a mistake, you had to get off the turntables. No matter what. That's why Grand Wizard Rasheen, like we didn't, he didn't, at that time he didn't fit in with the D because he was always, he always went somewhere. He was, he's inventive. He always went other places with it. Like we saw, we, I have a section that I played, then Master Guru ever since he played, then Grand Wizard would have a section. But when Grand Wizard get on, he would go, da -da 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 with the head, the nose, the turn, the ear, wait. They, see, that, they can't see you. That's showmanship. Excuse me, they couldn't see you. Like we behind walls and stuff. Like that's what you do when people are looking at you. That's the difference of it. So I wasn't being mean, but I would say, all right, you can't do that now. So I would take them off. I not take them off like trying to be mean, but you, you save that. Say we go do a show somewhere, then you could do that. I'd be playing the break. And he get on the mic. Start rhyming. But his rhyming had like his rhyming was more like singing and rhyming. Like the Temptations, like the Temptations would, they would, they would, the Temptations were rappers, but they added song to their, to their, to their little style. And if you listen to some of the, they had singing where they'd sing, but if you listen to some of the Temptations songs, they're rapping. It's like a rap group. Like the Cold Crush Brothers and Grandmaster Flash and the Romantic Five, the Freaks and all those in New York. Those, that, that, I actually, I looked up to them. They were the best thing that ever happened to me. They were inspirational to me as far as me. Oh my God, I gotta do that. I gotta do that. I gotta DJ because I want a rap group. And like the, 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 the DJs in New York were DJing with those MCs. They would play the beats. They would play beats, beats and stuff with the, and the rappers, but the rappers were sensational. That's the best thing I've ever heard in my life was those MCs back in those days in New York. Like they DJs, I never thought about them. They, you had, you know, names of Theodores and Grandmaster Pat, but my confidence level was way past them. I never thought about them. Never thought about them. But the MCs, incredible. All right, go back to the parties. So when I do the parties, I'm playing the breaks. And I'm, this is when I start scratching. Like, we're jazzing up the record. Choot, 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 so I can bring it in. To bring it in, better bring it on breaks. So we would take it, we, like, we taught ourselves, take it back one revolution and let it go right before that record goes off, One Revolution. And that's how we taught ourselves how to bring it in on beat. That's how we taught ourselves how to blend. When you blend, let the records go at the same time, two records go at the same time, so we blend the records. So this would come in, this would come in at the same time that was going off. So we would never, it was, we always be continuous. We didn't have to like stop it or scratch it. You know, at the radio station, the radios, they, the record go off and then you put the record on. We would make it, like one continuous record all the way through. The, whatever set, they call it a set now, but it wasn't a name for it then. So we would do that. So during the jam session, you, the, the breaks were small, so you had to catch them. So I would catch them, and the ones that I couldn't catch, I would dip, 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 and bring it in. But we called it jazzing up the beat, like I said. And we started getting bigger. We started doing bigger venues like the Hotel Philadelphia, Wagner Ballrooms, and the big events in Philadelphia. We were known then. We got known then. There were other groups out, and then everybody started catching on to DJing. But as far as playing beats, rocking parties, we were still the best. I, I'm not being arrogant, but we were still the best. They had better equipment. They would blow us out the world. Like they would come in there, like I did a party one time at Hotel Philadelphia and we, we had to take our equipment there. And another group named Soundstage brought their equipment there. And we were jamming and everybody was kicking, like, listening to us. And, oh man, they, they doing, they doing it. So, so Soundstage, the other group, they said, 
testing one, two, and nobody heard us. They music, they, they, they sound check was louder on the mic than our whole system. And so they started like blowing us out the water. So we were in a situation where we got, we got more equipment because we didn't have enough equipment. But hit, like, the DJs started getting more, more popular now, more popular now. And people were catching on to it. And they like, I don't know who heard me or how the scratching got out. It got told like it didn't have a name, but you know, Lady B, you heard of Lady B? Right. I started doing parties like for Bobby Dance and like doing parties with him. He was like, because he lived right around the corner. And he was like, he told me one time, because he, he was one of the DJs that we used to look up to, the, the disco, not the trance, but no hip hop. Him and Reds, this guy named Reds, DJ Reds, they were the best DJs around here. And he told me, when he heard about me, when he heard me DJing, he had to stop DJing because he said he couldn't do it. He couldn't, I said, he can't do that. I can't do that. He said, he told me, he said, I can't do that. This, I can't compete with you. And he lived right around the corner. So he started promoting and he became one of the best or what the best promoter in Philadelphia. Bobby dance, like club dances and all that. Yeah. He became the best. And he, he was one of the, he, him and Rez were the one of the, the two guys that, in, that where I got, like they did block parties, but they did block parties in a different manner from what I did block parties In respect for them. I came from them. I had my knowledge already from my from my father and what he did, but I came from them because that's that's where the streets that, that you know they did the block parties in the streets. But our music, our the way the way we played our music and the music that we did play was nothing what they did. Nothing what they did. Like their stuff was corny. We didn't. I'm not, I'm not playing that. That music. Was, say say if he put this particular record, he put on like Diana Ross or something like that. I'm not playing that. You're not going to hate it because like the way these people are here in in Southwest Philadelphia, they don't play that. Like if you put that on, like you 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 stand a chance to like after the party, they play that nut stuff, right? You don't play that mess no more. They 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 will tell you, they will criticize you for it. And I didn't play it. I made sure I didn't play it. I played everything that I felt as though they would like. That's my DJing. I never DJ to the point where I play the record that I like. I look for the response of the crowd. That's how I became good. That's why I was, I'm known. People like I to up to this day, people like don't nobody call me Raymond. They like, what's up, Grand Slam? What's up, Super Bad? What's up, Jam? Like I got I got five, ten, fifteen nicknames that people call me this from their memory. And they're like, man, you used to do. People still come up to me like, man, I remember you used to do parties. Up to this day, and I stopped DJing. And I just started to tell the people on the street, jokingly, they're like, why you ain't stop? Why you stop DJing? I said I stopped DJing until they catch up to how good I was. And once y'all catch up how good I was, I'll start back. Because y'all not y'all didn't catch up to me yet. Nobody was better than me. So I, I, I can afford to stop. I can retire ahead of time. Like like Jordan did. He's retired. He was still good. He was still great. But I and I was that good. I stopped DJing, but I stopped DJing because I had a child and I had to go to work. But that was my little joke that I added in. But I was still that good. Like nobody could do it. I wasn't worried about it. Like the Transformer Scratch. I don't know if I'm in re I'm, I don't know if I'm responsible for it, but I was, I, my hands were so fast when we, like, we got so good. My hands were so fast that the sound was, it was different. And Lady B used to call me Grand Slam Zigga Zigga DJ Jam because it wasn't no word for it yet. Or like when the radio station, I do a party, like, we was on a party, such and Grand Slam Zigga Zigga DJ Jam going to be there. That Zigga Zigga was the Zigga Zigga Zigga. That's the, the sound that I was making when I was scratching. Nobody paid it any attention, but everybody tried to take it and run with it. Everybody tried to get in my with All right, everybody's sitting in their basement and trying to do this and do that. But you wasn't doing that with those beats. Wasn't nobody doing it. I don't care how good they think they were, nobody. Superbad 2 tried to battle me. It was like four of them, and it was just me, and I was Superbad 1. So they tried to battle me down the bottom at, at one of the B-Force events. So when I came on, my performance, this is my performance. I, I had a guy hold up a curtain. And I had a fan blowing. It was blowing the curtain. So I had on a, a, a super bad, like a Superman costume with the little, I had the little Tars, the Speedos, the red Speedos. I had on white uh, surgical gloves and white sneakers. And I had a cape. And I, when, when I first came on, I played Trans Europe Express and a guy would let the curtain down real slow. If you know the record, the record transfer of Express, you know how it goes and come on. And he let it down. So he turned the fan so the fan would blow my cape, like Superman cape. It would blow in the cape backwards. And when I got on, 
I DJ, I play all the records that said super something in them, no matter what it was. Excuse me. Super distant, super distant, and I played them all in concession, and they make no mistakes. Took them all, put that on, took them all, put that on, and took them all, put that on, and won the contest. And all I, I wasn't, it wasn't about me trying to rock a crowd then. It was my performance that did it. And my, my whole, the whole everything, because I, was, I stood like this, like Superman was standing, and the cape blowing in the back. Yeah, and that, that's one of my proudest moments. Like, because they, they, they were supposed to be my friends, and they tried to separate from me. So I beat them to death, so to speak. I beat them to death. I just played beats. So everything that said super bad or super this or super sound, anything that said super something, I had, I had two of everything. And they were about that thick on both sides. You know, I would stack my records like that. So you just stack them and put one here and one there and one there and one there. I was spinning around, spinning around, and I, I was doing everything I could to beat them so bad that you would never want to separate from me again. It's like y'all ran away from home. You don't get a beating now. Like I would go to all record stores, and I would look, look, read on the back of the label, on the back of the rec album jacket, at the artist. And if I seen like, like my like my father had the records down here, so I would always read the back to see who the drummers were. So I was always in tune or looking at the label. A lot of labels, a lot of these labels had the same type of sound, like stacks and all that. So I know the label. This they got beats. So I look at the labels, and I'm looking at all the labels. All right, I did everything on stacks. Look at it, look at it, and. I would go in the store, and I would it, just buy hunches. My hunches, I got a whole lot of beats. I would go in like Third Street Jazz and look at this. Hey, this, this drummer's here, this drummer's here, or this label, that label, that label. I would get it. Then I would get it. I would look at the date, 1973, 1972. These were the times that everybody was trying to be like everybody else. They were emulating everybody else. So I knew that it was going to be a break somewhere in one of those songs. Get it, get it home. I got a break. Put it down. Bam. I got fat one. I go back. I buy the rest of them. So nobody get it. See if it was three of them. I bought this one this week. I went back and got those, the rest of them, so nobody would have it. So you're not going to have what I have when I have here at the party. But they didn't know, but I was ahead of my time. That's what I would do. That's what I was doing. That's why, I, like, over there, I got all my breaks. I got two and three of everything. And, and everything's in good condition because back to DJing, everybody used to spin back, try to go, choo, choo, choo. I didn't do that. I started needle dropping. Needle dropping is like taking the needle and put it back one notch on the album, on the record. Like, bump. Bump. So this way you ain't got to spin it back. You won't get the rain sound of your record. I just lift the needle up. I got to the point I was so good I could take it back one notch. And like the one revolution. Remember I told you I let it go one revolution. I could take it back one revolution. And I can see in the record that I can see in the album where there's a break. I, could say I, I was so focused on finding beats and stuff. I go to warehouses look for beats and go this place and I would look, pick it up and turn it around, take the record out if they open and look at it and I could just look at the record and like put it toward the light. There's a break right there. I would put the record on if the break is any good. Like I could see in a record, you can see where the instrument, you can see the instrumental part. The lighter it is on the album, the more music is in that particular section. The darker it is, which means it's less sound. Less sound means that there's a break, like a drum break a solo or whatever, but if you, I can look at it, I can tell. So I go everywhere. I used to go record stores, and some record stores have albums open. I can just take them out and I just look at them. This don't have nothing on there, I put it back. I used to go through, I would leave out at 12 o'clock and then come back in at 8 o'clock at night, going to, going to different record stores and different places and stuff, and like looking for looking for anything. Rock, it didn't make a difference. I wasn't prejudiced towards music. I didn't do it. I didn't. I never thought about that. I said because they play. Everybody played music at the same time, so I would figure out what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do. Certain record stores have certain things, so you would want to like get you. I I would actually want to get through that section real fast. I used to know how to go through it. Like I would go through it. I got to the point where I can just skip through it. This ain't nothing. This ain't nothing because I already seen them already in other places so I know what's what. And if I see something that I have never seen, like sometimes I look at an album jacket, it's a nice jacket. I would get it for the jacket and then have a beat on it. And lo and behold, and the nice jackets were the jazz albums. Because they took pride in their album jackets. I noticed them, hey, hey, because a, a lot of the rock groups, they did the crazy album jackets and the soul groups had everybody on it with their little outfits on. Like, you know, all the soul groups back in the 70s, they all had, they all dressed alike, so they all was on their album jackets. But the, but the jazz, the jazz album jackets, they were more classy. And jazz is a classier type of music. 
but jazz started getting funky, you know, with the breaks and stuff. So I focused on that. And that's when I hit the jackpot. I got all the jazz. All I just started finding all kind of beats and breaks and everywhere. And because jazz, you know, jazz musicians is more instrumental. There's not no singing. So you're going to get the breaks here and there and everywhere. And I just racked up. And then come breakbeat guy. And if you listen to all his music, the bongos and stuff and a lot of his breaks that he used because that's their heritage. Listen to, listen to, listen to some of the breaks. Yeah, he like messed me up because <laughs> I was like the king of the beats. I was the I was the Don Dada here like that. Oh my goodness. Then everybody started getting their break beats. All right, Ray, I got that. Ray, I got that. I got the original. So I never would play break beats at my parties. I always had the originals. I would actually have 45s and I would take the 45 and paste it on a 12 inch so I can mix it because it's hard to like mix the little 45s. So I would paste it right on there exactly right so you put it on the 12 inch and then mix the 12 inch like it's a regular record and that's how I like played my 45 a lot of a lot of beats were on the 45s so you had to work with what you can work with people never I've never seen it before but nobody figured it out nobody figured it out I'm still here I'm still there this is me this is not Master Groove this is not Grandma's Rashid this is what I'm doing like on 45s the grooves and the, the records are more of more spread apart, so you can on one revolution you can actually mix if you go one step back go boom but that to do that boom but that but do that because there's one revolution around the albums you see how wide the albums are you can't do that because you will get it you'll be off beat but in the 45s on the certain section of the 45s or most of the section of the 45 you can go one revolution back and mix you can and you can do it you can a rapper could be here and I can mix I can just sit here just like this and do it and do it and not even go off beat because you can't go off beat and it was just, it's that it was like sampling with your thumb go figure but I didn't I didn't really I didn't really want no rapper behind my beats our beats were sickening like we didn't know how good we were we had no idea and Grand was come on with that singing style we would like turn the mic down not to be mean, but <laughs> yo, they didn't want the people didn't want to hear it. And like back then, when we were DJing for it, they were all gangsters. They were like the gang members. Like we would like when I come to a party, if it's if we in the party where two different gangs will be there, this guy in this gang will give me his gun, and this guy in the other gang will give me his gun. I'll put their guns in my crates, in my record crates, to sneak them in the party. But I did it so they wouldn't fight. They think they doing it so they thinking they gunning. But I did it so y'all wouldn't fight and shoot my parties up. So I had both gang guns. See, I was my father raised me, so he raised me to be smart in both sides of life. You know, I got the outdoor and I got the good education. I went to Catholic schools, so I got the good education and I got the street smarts too. So he, could, he my father told me, don't never come in after him. Don't never come in the house after him. Like if he, when he's in, I'm I better be in before him or walk past the house. Don't come in his house. So I already know. Don't come, don't, that, that kept me off the streets. It kept me off the streets. But anyway, back to DJing, the needle dropping, nobody knew, nobody knew about it. But needle dropping was where, well, I used to, this time I used to skip, skim through my records to find breaks. When I go in places, I had to go through real fast, so that's how I learned how to needle drop exceptionally well, because I used to always had to go real fast. Do, 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 ain't no break on that, bam. Do, 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 ain't no break on that, bam. I go right through, I go right through that, and I go right through that. I could go through 10, 15 records in about five minutes. Both sides, just because I can look at them and see. Like I would look at it if it's all if it's all like light, real, real light grooves. I don't even put it on because I know it has no break in it. Then I would look at names of songs. Like they got like if you if you see a record that say uh, the funky whatnot, you would actually have to try to play it because it sounds like something that would have a beat in it. So that's what I would do. My mind was there. I was focused. I was totally focused. Like I would never pick up a Barbara Streisand record. But Engelbert Humperdinck, I looked at one of his records, and he had breaks, like because they they had orchestras, and the orchestra sometimes, like when they come on, the drummer will play, and you if you didn't know music, you would never know it, you would never know it. But Engelbert Humperdinck, they, they I think he had his band was associated with Barbara Streisand's band because of the labels. I know the labels and everything, so I, I told you I do labels too, so. 
Uh, would I, if I look at this Barbra Streisand, I wouldn't play it. Uh, Ingerbert Humperdinck, yeah, I don't know, let me see. And I would turn it over and hey, there you go. Even if it's a sound effect, I got something out of it. Say if like, you want to play a certain record, say if you want to change the tempo, you would put a sound effect on to, like, to get everybody in the room, stop. You, do, you never want nothing playing. You want to have something on. Sound effect, get the ear. Hey, that sounds different. That's kind of weird, you know. And then you'll put something on. Hey, da -da -da -da, and then they go dancing again. Hey, I got them. I got them. I got them. Cause like after the parties, like, I could tell after the parties, when the, like, everybody leaving the parties, they all sweating. So I knew I had them. It was all three of us. So I'm not, going, I'm not leaving nobody out. I don't want to leave nobody out. We all were together. We all played our different sets. But it came down to a time where when I was, when I did stop DJing, a lot of the guys that was promoting parties and stuff, they was telling me, yo, just bring the records. You ain't got to bring no equipment. I told you, they used to blow us out the water with equipment. So I ain't never, no, I'm not going against them. These are Captain Boogies and Sex Machine. They would come with scaffolding, scaffolds. They put, put the scaffold up and then put the speakers on the scaffold. And little old me, I got like four speakers. Like, I'm not even there. I'm not even there. I'm like a, I'm like a, a monitor for real. So I stopped. They, they would tell me, they, they would say, just bring your records. All right. So now, when they say bring your records, they wanted me to leave my crew. Like, I had to make, like, they, they, like, bring your records, like, telling me, like, we'll leave them too. Well, I'm not, at, the, at that particular time, I'm not, I don't want to put myself on the pedestal, but I was better than the guys in our crew at what I did. So they would ask me, you know, just come by yourself. So I used to get mad at him because, like, you know, we was a crew. I didn't want to break us up. I used to get mad, like, but I had still had to pursue what I was doing, too. I had to weigh my options and, oh, God, I got to do this now. I have to do this now. And I just, I just did it. And I would go. I, I did it for a while, for a little while, about a year. And I would go play my records and stuff. Then I had to wind up watching my records. Because guys were going through my records. Say if I walk off stage and I got my records on stage, and I would have to go look at my records, and then my Apache was missing, the Incredible Bongo Band. I had the originals, and they were in 3D, like a 3D. Like you could rub the album jacket, and you could take the bongos that was on it, and the fingers that was on you could feel them. They, they, were, they, they were originals. Somebody took them. So I went up on stage. I just, this, guy was, this guy was DJing. They were doing party people in, in the crowd. I went up on stage and took his, the needle off his record and got on the mic. Whoever stole my records, bring them back. If you don't bring them back, nobody's going to party. So the, 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 the promoter came up there, man, you can't do that. Don't tell me what I can do. They went in my crate and stole my records. I'm, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm headlining this particular show. I, I need that. So he said, well, don't do that no more. Don't tell me what, don't do that no more. I'm from Southwest, so I'm not scared of nobody else. That like, we were like the most feared section of the city, so that you don't, you're not bothering me. Somebody better come on my records. And I had two of them. I told you, I had all, I had all originals. Everybody else had the crap, eat meat to the beat, break beat stuff. I didn't, that, that, that was embarrassing if I put a break beat on. I never would put a break beat on. So nobody came up with my record. Nobody had it. Nobody, they, they, nobody seen it. They, they, they just took that one incredible bongo, man. I had all them other beats in there. I, just, I had a crate full of beats. They took that. That was my pride and joy. They took it. So I did not DJ again at an event. You want to take my records? I just put it all down here. I never DJ an event again. Never. But I, all, I still beat hunting. I went crazy. I found the warehouse in Yaden, four floors. Four floors, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of records. Because, like, the, all the record stores up and down the East Coast, when they used to get returns, so people, the records didn't sell, they would send them to that particular warehouse. How did I stumble onto it? I lost it. I would be in that record, I would be in that warehouse from eight to eight till they closed. I would like, and I would buy, this is what I was doing. I was buying the records and stuff there, like the old, old rap records, like the, in, like the early stuff on the Enjoy label that didn't sell because nobody knew about it. People, it started catching on. So people wanted it now. But they, New York was sending their stuff to the warehouse, unopened. I would buy the records from there for a quarter. Take them down to all the record stores in Philadelphia and sell them. I would get on the trolley with 300 records with a, like with a, with a hand truck and go down and sell them. Go back and find them and go back to the warehouse the next day. Go through everything. I, was, I used to be up on, I used to be like two, two stories high in the sky, like 
digging through all of it. It was so many of them that I, I still didn't get through them. I still didn't get through all of them. But I went through almost everything. One lady said, she said, nobody's ever did what you did. She said, There's, she said nobody knows what's in this place but you. Like, like I knew what, where everything was in that place. Nobody, the managers, the owners, whoever they were, four floors, nobody, I knew where everything was at. They were like, do you know what such such is at? And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a customer. I'm, I'm not, I don't work there, I'm a customer. And they, they, it's on the third floor to your left on the, to the third shelf. And they would go get them. Like some people would order stuff. They order stuff. And I would, and I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm a customer. And they would ask me what stuff, because nobody wanted to go through. It was so many records. They used to have big barrels about this wide with wax. Like racks that they would melt to make albums. Like this place was big. Like I knew there was a printing place in here somewhere, but they never let me see it. I start finding beats now. And that's when I just went beat crazy. I just found this beat. Because they had a record, they had a turntable there. And they would let me listen to them. And I, that's where I got a lot of my 45 breaks at. And I would just 45 this, just take them all. Just The 45 is like a 10 cent. But I would, like I told you, I, I bought everything. So nobody gonna have it. So the stuff that I wanted, I kept. And the stuff that I wanted to sell to the stores, I sold to the stores. I started putting beats in the stores, like beats that was on the break beats. I started putting the originals in the stores. And the stores would sell them out. Like Funko Mart, they would sell them out. Like I'm talking in four or five days, all, this, all the records are gone. All the records are gone. Like we would, I, I was supplying with beats and now I'll come back in there like, Ray, we need more. And this place had limited stuff, so whatever I could get, I would have to give them. I couldn't give you the same thing because I bought all of them. The guys that worked in the record stores didn't know about Beats, so how would they know to order them? I was putting them in the stores. They didn't know it. They were like the people, the people that was buying them didn't know it. They didn't know I was supplying them stores with them breaks. They was knowing that the guy in the store were like, "Yeah, we got Beats right there, man. We got." They was taking the credit, so to speak. I didn't care because all you had to do was come down here. Like, if we had more time, like. To go over there like and listen to the music and my breaks and everything, you would be down here for like two or three days. Cause I, like, I'm a collector. I just don't have junk. Like a lot of guys have a whole bunch of everything. I have like Disney, uh, black mo black movie soundtracks, uh, speeches, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Pope John Paul. I have those kind of you know. I have. A, lot, a whole lot of orchestra music. Like when I go to people's houses and say if I'm going to go to somebody's house and I see records, I automatically think I got to get these records out of this house somehow. I cut hair, so I will offer them a haircut and get the whole collection. And I might have all that stuff except one thing, but it was worth getting that one album as opposed to me like, all right, I got to pay for all that. I will get one album that I don't have and they, they might have 25. I'm taking all 25 and I might have 24 of them, but that one that I don't have, that I cut that hair for, that's what I cherish. And I take it and I got it now. Like I would hear about something, I got it and I, and I would just keep going. They come out with records and stuff, all the rappers would come out with records. I already knew what the originals was. I did. Like Sugar Hill Gang, one of the best groups ever. One of the best groups that would duplicate these, these, these musical groups, the, the breaks that they would find them and enjoy. Like 80, 81, I was more or less perfect, like perfect, no mistakes, do this, do that, fine. I had beats here and the, 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 this guy in New York named Fresh Gordon, he made Gordy's Groove. He came here and I, he came, he had a, a family member that lived in Philadelphia that was about my, was with my arch rival group B-Force. You know, they were, we were always back to back, like I, they wanted to battle me. I, I never had an individual battle in my life. Group to group, we had battles, but nobody never battled me individually. Like, say, if somebody say, Ray, I'm gonna battle you. Why would you take that chance? Like, I'm, I'm gonna I'm kill you. This is what my mindset was. You don't have what I have. When you're battling and DJing, it's the records that you're playing to battle with. Like, with, say, one on one in basketball, it's not the basketball that they're battling with, it's the individual athlete. In DJing, it's the record. It ain't me. If, I, if I'm no good, but I put on that best, mm, that best song, I'm going to beat you. So what I did was, if you ever want to battle me, you have to, you have to go up against my, my, my uh, arsenal. You're not going to beat me. And that, these are my words. That's what I used to tell them back then. I was 17. You're not going to beat me. I was very, very, very arrogant, but I backed it up. You're not going to beat me. Like, All you're going to do is play beats. So? <laughs> so? 
what you got. You got two rap records. There wasn't no rap records out there. You're not going to beat me. You're not going to beat me with Cameo or uh, Jane Brown. I got that. You're not going to do You're not going to beat me with that. I got hard to find. Every week, somebody would say, what you got new, Ray? I knew you got something new because I always went record shopping every week and I always played something new. I always bought something new to play because I never wanted to play the same thing. Like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a set. Like, say if I DJ right now, I just got back into DJing recently by the past two or three months. DJ Miz was helping me get back into my little flow. Now I got my little flow back. But I know the music already. So now I'm up to date with the new music and I got the old music in me. I'm ready to go again. But there's a lot of little animosity with the DJs now. Everybody think they, everybody got a little chip on their shoulder. But remember what I said, I stopped DJing until y'all catch up how good I was. So now if I come back, y'all got to go. This is, this is my mindset. This is why I'm right now. This is me right now. And I've been seeing myself when I DJ. I, hey, I'm, I'm, I would go to places like for the past year. I've been going to places and watch other DJs. No, you, you can't. This is not going to be able to be, 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 be DJ with me. I don't have to scratch and can be successful DJing. Because I did a party one time and I DJed. And somebody came up to me and said, you sounded like you were playing one record for two hours. Because I was blending so good, and the tempo was so good that I would, I just kept it going. And they came up to me and they gave me a tip and said, "You saw you was DJing for about two hours the same song, but it was it was perfect, it was perfect." They said, "Oh, so I told you, like I said, we we were striving for perfection. There was no way you can make a mistake. You can't make a mistake. And I want to see crowd reaction. I want to see the people on the floor. That's what that's what beats are for. See, every record has to beat." You've never seen an acapella, acapella record win an award. It's a beat behind it. You're not going to see no acapella win an award because you have to have a beat, no matter how you look at it. And I played drum machines. That's a different, oh my goodness. I had every single drum machine, every single one, all the way back from the Grandmaster Flash to the beat drum machines to the Lindrum, Michael Jackson, the... Uh, the NPC 60s, all the drum machines. Cause I was always fascinated like for beats, like beats was my whole thing. The BSR, we went and got the BSRs from Funkomart and they didn't have the like, the, they, didn't, they didn't have like the, uh, the weight on the back. So we would have to put pennies or nickels on the top of the cartridge. So when we scratched, it wouldn't jump. The news wouldn't jump. So we put like a penny or two pennies on it. So when we scratched, it wouldn't jump or nothing like that. But the BSR, we didn't know what it stood for. So we would call it the, I don't want to curse on camera, we would call it the bull recorder. <laughs> you know, because it's BSR bull. So we would, that's what we call them. And everybody else, like, like the te techniques had a turntable out, I think it was the 1900, the 1800, something like that. It was, it's the equivalent to the 1200 it is now. But they were like $2,000. This is back in 1890. 1980, 79. It was like the best turntable that you could get. But DJ wasn't that popular, so we wouldn't think about buying that turntable at the time. Because they would have belt drive and direct drive. And the belt drives were better when you let the belt drive go, it go and beat. Direct drive would drag a little bit, so you had to push it. So the BSRs were belt drives. So we would get them and you could carry two of them in one arm and walk down the street. But the, the turntables now, you can't. They're too heavy. You can't carry them now. On my front porch, they used to come off from work every day. My mother, father, and they'd be 10 people on the porch, and I'm up there because people were fascinated about the DJing. Grandmaster Nell, he used to come from South Philly, be on the front porch watching me DJ. I mean, I'm, this is, these are like name, well named people, like people that DJ. Like, I can't even remember all the people, but they, like, my mother and father came home from work. When I got out of school, I came home and I, my, my setup was on the porch, my front porch, which we, which we came in. It would be, they, my mother and father had to say, excuse me, to get from the, that first door to that second door to get in the house. But they never stopped me. They never said, you can't handle company. They always, they always was behind me. Because it was something, it was something brand new. They, they never saw it neither. It was something new. They never saw it neither. Like my father would come home from work one day early and I was down here playing his music. And I had the doors locked. And I had the top lock on the other door so he couldn't get in. So I heard somebody at the back door banging on the back door. And I knew it was him, because he was the only one that would know how to come to the back door. So I had the music blasting down here. I said, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. So I turned the music off and went upstairs and unlocked the door and went in the living room and watched TV. He came in, 
and went right upstairs and didn't say anything to me. I know he heard the music. I know he heard the music and he didn't say nothing to me. He just, like, they knew that I was on to something. So he didn't bother me, he didn't curse me, he didn't say nothing to me, but he always told me, do not touch his music. So he knew when I was touching his music, cause like he knew where the records were and everything like that. So I didn't, I touched the music. Put it like, I touched the music. So I'm not even gonna lie to you, I'm not gonna lie to nobody, I touched the music. That's how I got to where I am now. But we'd be out there trying to DJ and trying to try new stuff. And this was when Grand was Rasheem, this is how he got his little spark. His little, he was a trickster. He was always, I told you that he always did something spinning around and with the chin and he always tried to add something to his little, his little neck to it. I knew how to do that too. Like do the, all the tricks. Like I would DJ, don't dive under the table, get on this side of the table, mix and come back on this side, handcuffs, I do with the handcuffs. Do, 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 do. But like I said, my records start getting messed up. I picked up on that early too, because I hear the records had rain in them. And no, no, I paid too much money. I paid too much money. And then you can hear it on big, on like big equipment. Like I told you, when other people start inviting to their venues, you can hear it. No, like when I first would go on, I would get, I would get butterflies and jittery, and my hands would shake, and you can't scratch and stuff. And I would always, like, I, I, I wish this would stop, and it always kept, like, every party. Like not the not the not the little parties. The little parties, I'm all confident. I ain't worried about nobody. But the big venues, when you got a hundred people, when I first get up there, I'm like this, and my hands are shaking. I'm like, oh god, and, it, and people can see it. I'm not. You, I can't. Like I can't hide it. I'm right there. Like man, you shaking, Ray? So what? But once I get the little flow going, once I get my little confidence out there, the butterflies are going. I'm right. When I first start off, I did this, I did a concert. We did a show at the Civic Center. There's about 3,000 people there. It's the first big rap show, the first big DJ show in Philadelphia. And I did the show. When I first started off, when I first started DJing, I couldn't even put my hand on a record. I, if I did, it was, it was scratching by itself. That's how much I was shaking. And that, that's, that's, my, like, that's my personal thing. Other than that, I never worried about nobody else. I never thought about another person. Like a lot of guys, like the Cash Money's and the Jazzy Jeffs and those guys, and I never, like, when they were out there doing their thing, I had already did what they did, so it didn't, it didn't fail. Like I told you, it didn't phase me none. I was, all right, I was proud of them because they were like getting down. They was like doing their thing, but it got to a point where everybody was like, he, uh, he got his own style. He got his own style, and they completely forgot about me. They all completely forgot about me. My, like, like you said, you try to pull up information on me, you can pull up more information on me. They, cause they hid me. They hid me. They asked me, like, when you say, how did, where did you, if you ask these guys, where did you get your style, where did you learn this stuff from, they gonna have to say me. They can't say nobody else. They, they're not gonna be able to say nobody else. I'm put, this is on camera. You can't say nobody else. I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm so to speak responsible. I didn't teach these guys. Like, some of them, like I said, some of them, came on my, on my mom's porch and they watched me DJ. I didn't teach these guys. Like they, like Cash Money, he was part of Super Bad Disco. That, that, which is our, that was our name, Super Bad Disco. They were Super Bad Disco too, but they were Super Bad Disco. You know, they like broke off and branched off. They were younger. Like Jazzy Jeff used to watch me at parties and like be, I'd be in the park or Launchwood, Black Oak Park we called it back then. I would DJ in the park and stuff. And they would actually they would actually be there. Like, if you, if you go and ask him, did you ever see Grand Slam Jam? He has to say yes. Because you did, I seen you there. I'm here and you was in the crowd. So don't say that you didn't see me. I'm not saying that you got anything from me, but you were there, you were on that side of the tables. And you were young, he was 15, 14, whatever. He was young, so you can't say that you did not see me. All right, now who else was that? Like, like the guys that were real good, that, that were real good, like, I'm like, oh man, these guys are, these, they, they, they became competition with, to me. Like Grandmaster Nell, B-Force, Cosmic Kev. You heard of Cosmic Kev? Yeah, they, they, but they were, like I said, competition. But I never had that individual battle. Like, oh, you take that chance if you wanted to, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a terror, I'm a terrorize you. This is my mindset, you try me. I wanted you to try me because I, I, wanted to, I wanted to play that new stuff that I never played on you.
by beat collecting influence on people. You ever heard of DJ Doodles? Yeah, that, like he would be, I, I, he would tell you, I taught him how to beat hunt. Cash money, the same way. That's my influence. Like the DJing part, that don't really make me no difference because I know you're not going to beat me DJing per se. But to, to be the beat collector that I was, to have no knowledge of beats at all and actually like accomplish what I accomplished, that's something that took me all, like that's what made Raymond Long DJ Jam. My whole premise was to rock the party, like to kick it. No, I didn't care about beats. I didn't care about what you had on. I wanted to make sure that you were jamming. I never played the records that I liked. I played the records that you liked. And I played them the way you wanted to hear them. That's what made the scratching come in because I had to jazz up the record to, to get you more hype for the next record. My next record was always better than the last record. And the last record that I played that night was the record that you was like, all oh, right, that's it. He did it. And then you could walk out the party and like he was kicking it. That's how I got other parties because they were like, my God, you got to do my party. Up to this day, I did a party Thursday night. In a, in a place where there was a the party, a guy was DJing, DJ Miz. You heard of DJ Miz? He wanted supremacy too. It come, as a matter of fact, the supremacy, uh, Jazzy Jeff, he won one, Cash Money won two supremacies, and DJ Miz won the supremacy. They all from here. And Cash Money from Southwest, DJ Miz from Southwest, and Jazzy Jeff from Southwest. Where did they come from? Yeah. Some way, somehow, you gotta bring it back here. They had to come back here. They right in this vicinity. I'm talking about Cash Money was across the street. Miz was on 58th Street, that's two blocks away, and Jeff was like five blocks away. And that's four supremacy, and the contest was in New York, not here. It was the world supremacy, but they all, and we, used to, we went up there and, and beat them to death. They got, they got tired of Philadelphia winning it. Because we were different. The New York DJs the New York DJs were nowhere near as good as, nowhere near as good as we were. They took me up there, that, I, was, I was the rep, like, they represented me. Like them, them, them guys, I, I'm not, I don't want to appear to be arrogant, but they represented me. Jeff, Cass, all them, that's, that was me that they took up to New York and did it. Because when Jeff used to mix and, and Fresh Fish used to do his little, da, 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 he, like, I never had an MC to back up my, me, my beats and my music. I never had that. I just straight did it like instrumental. If I had that, well, Rasheen used to do that. That's why I said Rasheen was always right there with me. I'm not never going to put him, myself in front of him. I'm not going to put myself in back of him. He was always right there. Like, we were side by side. Like, not no Batman and Robin. Like, two Batmans. Not no Batman and Robin. Master Groove, like I told you, he was in the group too, but he was like the, the cool guy, the slacker, and the stand. And the he was like this with the poses. But me and Rasheen was always the innovators. Like I said, we went back to the garage playing the pots and pans and everything. That's what, you know, I'm never going to leave him out. He... He flourished later on. Grand Wizard flourished later on. He's great now. I stopped, but I never lost it. See, and I just got it back. And now, to, I, and, and, and the way I'm now, I'm still the same way. Y'all like, in trouble now. People are going to start losing their jobs. It's like the DJ, the, the DJ scene is like getting popular again. Like people want DJs as opposed to the jukeboxes now. They used to, the jukeboxes that knocked us out. Like these little events, these little, 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 little spots and everything you go to. But when I'm hearing that Paris Hilton is DJing and she's getting $15,000 a show and she's using the iPod, iPod, iPod. yo, you're embarrassing the game now. You're embarrassing. No, no, you're not. No, you're not going to do that to me. No, you're not. So I say, I'm going back out there. I have the knowledge. Like, I, all I did was sit down here for like 10 years straight and listen to all music. I just sat down here. I said, listen, listen to everything. And just, it's all in my mind now. So I would know what to play and when to play it. Like, I know how, I, I can, somebody give like, Play, play a nineteen, play a two thousand and one set. I won't have I won't have no set pattern, but I could go. My mind could go right to two thousand and play those songs that came out that year. Like I went down to Virginia one time, and they had a nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety something class reunion, and that's when Shadow the Compton, whenever all, whenever all that stuff came out, the Doctor V stuff came out. And these were like millionaires, lawyers, and like this was a particular type of person. Like they were clean, black tie, but this was a class reunion. I had the people dancing on tables. I went down there, and they, they were actually, these were the secretaries making, they, the, the, guys, the guys was telling me, that they was like, he said, see that girl over there? She makes $200,000 a year, and she's dancing on the top of a table. Like I got them on table dancing, and they came over to me and said, 
we had never heard a DJ like that. Where are you from? I said, Philadelphia. They said, that's why. But I had, I'm talking about my people, that millionaires, they was out there like getting their groove on, like they forgetting about, you know, even you know, when you go to these social events like the Grammys, you know, you have to be such and such, such and such. You have to have a certain demeanor about yourself. No, they let it go. They let, they let it loose. I know I can do it other places, and I proved it. I would go to skating rinks. Like, I don't like doing skating rinks because you have to play a particular song. And I did one skating rink one time, and I remember I did a skating rink. And they wanted to fire their house DJ that night to get me the DJ. Like, like, and then what I'm saying, what I'm saying to you and the way I'm talking to you right now, I actually will, I actually can prove it. I can actually, like, I can say, I can ask you to come to an event and watch me DJ and just watch the people. And, like, I, to an event that I've never been to, I don't want you to come to something that I've been all all the days and you like, oh, yeah, well, he always there. That's why they know him. No, I want you to come to an event that I don't know nobody and do it. But that's what I did Thursday night. This is the place that I did Thursday night. I never did it before. And the guy told me, this is my house, DJ, but take, give me your number. I want you for the rest of my events. I'll keep him here, but I want you to do my main stuff. And th this is DJ Miz. He got a supremacy trophy. He's like one of the best. He's just, he's good. He's so good. That, and I texted him the other night. I'm like, I, I, I owe you because you, he gave me the opportunity to get back on. Like he asked me, like, let me do parties with him. Like, and he can't, like, he, in his mindset, people are thinking that's him. Like, when you say if I'm DJ, somebody's DJing, and you go outside and you can still hear the music, you still think that's that DJ on. So somebody told me the other night, they, they went outside, and they, I was, I was so to speak, kicking it. And it was like, man, I thought, I, I thought that was DJ Miz on. It was me. They, but they came back, when they came back in the door, they seen me, and they, oh, I thought it was Miz is good. This is real good. He has a mic game. Like, you know, I speak on the mic too. So, but I got a DJ game. And my DJ game is like real sickening. And that's where I, that's where I always came up. I've always been like real confident as far as DJing. Like, when you get put a record in my hand, it's like Peyton Manning, like a football. Yeah, he knows what to do with it. You see him, he's, he feels real good and confident. He got that ball. He's just standing there and he's holding that ball. He know what he can do with it. And I know what I can do with that, with that, with that, with that record. I know what I can do with it.